Ben Nash here. I'm a co-founder at XY Advisor and founder of financial advice business Pivot Wealth. My business baby I started from scratch a bit over six years ago. In that time, I've leveraged some of the learnings of the XY community to scale the business and become one of the better known financial advice businesses for high income accumulators. You can join me each Tuesday as I have the privilege of interviewing some amazing people where I'll selfishly be able to uh, continue my personal journey to improve every aspect of my advice process and hopefully you can learn a few things on the journey as well. Jump over to xyadvisor.com if you haven't signed up already to share and learn from other advisors or simply download the app. Zurich is the proud partner supporting this episode. As one of Australia's largest life insurers, Zurich encourages the promotion of positive conversations leading to a more sustainable future for life insurance. Committed to championing financial advice through education and research-led market insights. Hey guys, Ben Nash from the XY Advisor crew and today I'm pumped to be here with my Kokoda walking buddy, Sean Hunt. Uh, Sean is an advisor down in lovely Radelaide, principal advisor at Hunt Wealth. They've been going for coming up to 10 years, not that you'd be able to tell from that baby face of his, but uh, Sean, uh, thanks for joining us, buddy. Thanks, Ben. Pleasure to be here. Mate, I um, am keen. I know you're uh, based down in, in Radelaide. Um, you're under the Paragym license with one support staff, working with about 100 clients, mainly in that uh, retiree space. So I'm keen to pick your brain a bit about the, ser- the evolution of your business, service solution, and then um, how you're driving efficiency and what you're doing. I thought maybe a good place to start is just talking through the evolution of your business and, and how you've ended up where you are today. Yeah, okay. So I started um, advising about um, 13 years ago, um, working for a small boutique firm. And there was about five ARs in that business, all business owners at the time. Um, and when they decided to sort of split up, um, I bought a very small client base from a retiring advisor at the time. Um, he was in his 60s, so again, very um, or predominantly uh, retirement advice. Um, so I started with that very small client base and just grew it from there. Um, and one of the things where I started um, was just sharing um, resources with a couple of the other advisors. So we started off with a bit of a co-op model um, keeping our businesses separate and our clients separate, but using a shared business to basically run our staff and run our premises at the time. Um, and that sort of evolved over the last 10 years with a couple of different advisors, um, but predominantly keeping that same model. And for me, like advice-wise, I still work a lot in that retirement space, but if you do a good job for your clients, which I believe we do, uh, we have had a lot of sort of the younger children referred to us and sort of the business is growing in different directions from there. Yeah, nice. So I'm keen to talk a bit about the the service solution for clients, but one of the things that you touched on there was that the co-op model that where you started initially pooling resources uh, across businesses. I know that um, I did that at Pivot in the early days as well, um, where we had a few different businesses and sharing sharing a bit of the cost, sharing some of the um, yeah the resourcing where you don't ha- really have the the need or the budget for a for a full time resource. Can you unpack it, sort of what what um, how that came together and and how it's evolved over the over the last you know eight and a bit years? Yeah, so when I started, um, there was two other advisors that uh, were part of the bigger business that all sort of split up. Um, so basically, again, yeah, we just pulled our resources. So we ran our own cars and our own licenses. We were all licensed by the same dealer at the time, which obviously made it a little bit more convenient, but would have worked either way. Um, so essentially, we hired a couple of admin staff between the three of us. So again, sharing that cost across the three of us um, and rented out a premises. So we have a joint company that basically runs all the business side of things. And then us, each personally, we just run the, the AR and the car through our own entities. Um, but really just paying a, a service fee to that joint business, which covers off on, on all the costs of running the business. And when I started, so the client base I bought was about maybe 100, 100 odd K in recurring revenue. So it was a pretty small business to start with and trying to set up an office and staff from, from that position would have been pretty tricky. So it really helped me, I guess, get that starting point um, and be able to build from there. Mm. And you you mentioned so you've got your your core business in in Hunt Wealth and 
Uh, we are just chatting a bit offline that you've got a joint venture with an accounting business. Can you unpack, um, yeah, what what sort of, uh, how that actually works in practice and how you've structured things on that side? Yeah, so it's probably slightly unique. So part of my dealer group at the time, which was um, Securator, they were also licensing this accounting firm and they had a few employed advisors that had worked for them at the time. So over about two years, they'd been trying to get a financial planning business off the ground and their last advisor just up and left very suddenly. So they had work on the go and clients needing help at the time um, with an advisor that kind of disappeared. Um, so I just stepped in being part of the same license. It was pretty easy for me to be able to help those clients. So I just started doing some basically consulting work for the accounting practice. Uh, but they run the financial planning business as a separate entity. Uh, but over time, that sort of grew, and uh, basically, I bought into that that small business. When I started helping them, the recurring revenue there was only about thirty grand, which is a pretty disappointing effort after two years of work. Um, but we've grown it, probably quadrupled it, and plus more since that point in time. But it's been a bit challenging because obviously, I was running a full time business and I wasn't working part time when I started helping yeah. them. So balancing the two has been a bit, of, a bit of a challenge. But when I bought in, so basically we share, so I own 50% of that business now and there's two accounting partners that own 25 each. Um, so we share the profits from that and essentially I just charge a fee for the work I do. So all the other costs come out of the business like power planning and those things, but I charge a, a very reduced sort of hourly rate for the work that's done and then we just split the profits that, that come out of the business on top of that. Okay, and so these are the typically clients of the accounting firm that then get introduced to you as the financial planning solution to support them working in conjunction with the accountants. Is that right? Yeah, absolutely. So they've been trying to, to use a bad term, but that one-stop shop and being able to help clients in other areas for a long time. So, you know, dabbling in mortgage broking, financial planning in other areas. Mm -hmm. um, so really it was about obviously just helping their clients in, in you know, as much as they can, um, but having that consistency across the two businesses and the clients knowing that, you know, we're talking to each other. So, you know, for example, with the self managed super fund clients, when we're doing the investment work and those things, we still know what's happening on the other side um, and helping each other out, essentially. Yeah, I think that there's a lot of businesses out there in the financial services sphere that you, they'll start go, oh, yeah, it's a great idea to do, you know, mortgage broking or accounting or financial planning or whatever, but um, if it's not the focus and that that sort of, yeah, getting people from one side to the other, doing it in a way that aligns with what the client wants, the, the communications there, uh, it's pretty challenging. And I think a lot of them like the, the it sounds like these guys experienced before um, you got involved that it doesn't quite work in the in the way that you'd expect. And it is like we've contemplated potentially expanding into different service lines in the past. But when we took the time to actually map out what's involved and thinking through how much focus it actually requires to, you know, nail that and nail it in a way that's consistent with your other brand, it is quite a lot of work. I'm interested to like what what are the things that you've found to be quite effective in in growing, you know, because I think it applies like if you've got it, you've clearly got a structured uh, joint venture um, company type setup, but obviously a lot of advisors that are listening along would be working with other partners at some level. What do you think are really the keys there to success in fostering and growing a relationship like that? Yeah, I mean, I'd start by saying it is very challenging um, yeah. and, you know, there's a very different mindset for accountants and financial planners. It took a while. I mean, these, unfortunately, one of the, I'd say one of the key things is both of these accountants are, well, the partners are quite proactive and they want to make this work. So they're not, you know, they're not trying to go in sort of dabbling in it. They want it to be successful. So they are actively, you know, seeking out opportunities, but it's also really the toughest part is building their understanding of what financial planning is, mm. understanding the process and, to be honest, how much harder bringing a client on from our perspective is than potentially for them. Um, yeah. Not to, you know, I, I value the work they do, but, you know, financial planning is pretty challenging and it hasn't gotten easier over the last few years. So it's, it's really their understanding of not only the process, but also, you know, potentially how long it takes to nurture a financial planning client. So going from mm. the first, first meeting to actually getting paid sometimes is 
a bit of a stretch for accountants. Um, but I think it is just that that constant nurturing of, you know, educating them around what the process is and how it works, but also who are the right type of clients because accounting clients and financial planning clients, you know, our ideal clients are very, very different. So, you know, yeah. they might have a, a wonderful business client who's you know, perfect for their business, but from a personal financial planning perspective, they might not be really a hard. client at all. Yeah, or they have a, you know, an accounting client who seems from their perspective to be somewhat low value to lack of a better term, but might be an ideal planning client because of yes. what they're looking to do and, and what the opportunities are. Absolutely, yeah. That's one of the things that I in fact, actually shied me away from um, pursuing more referral type relationships earlier on in the business because I, like a lot of people, you hear, oh, yeah, you've got to build your centres of influence and, you know, get your leads and, like, all of that stuff. And when you're trying to grow your business and your revenue, then obviously you you want that stuff. But we fostered a, a couple of relationships and, they were really pumped with what we were doing and behind the cause and they would introduce us to people and I felt a sense of obligation like I do with anyone I suppose that is introduced to the business but particularly someone that's been introduced into the business by someone that we've got a relationship with and have a conversation with the people and lovely people um, maybe you know differing levels of stuff going on financially not none of them necessarily really good or, or really bad or well, there was lots I, I suppose a lot of really good ones <laughs> um, you you they sort of like not the not the right fit and I just sort of ended up for a lot of them just sort of almost like a bit of coaching and guidance and like taking them on a bit of an education journey to show what are the things that they should be thinking about. And often it was like, these are the things that need to happen and we can continue a conversation. But at this point, it's not going to be a formal conversation because it's not there. And that ends up being quite a resource drain. You know, I think that it's great to help people and there's, you know, we have some targeted time that we focus on that. But when you're in that um, business building sphere that you want to make sure that there's a there's a return on the time that you are um, invested in that. So it can be can be quite challenging if they don't have that education. It, how have you gone about that? Is there any um, particular strategies or tactics that you've used to help educate the accountants on what actually makes an ideal client for you or how you can segment and target the people that um, that you should be having conversations with? Yeah, so initially um, with the dealer group, we did spend some time, you know, sitting down with four of us sort of mapping out those the sort of ideal clients, what they look like, what they're looking for. Um, but again, it's a bit of a challenge that there's not always that cross-section. Like we might say, you know, in my example, a very good retiree client, but they don't have anyone in that age bracket. So we had to find some middle ground. And to your point about that obligation, that's a really big thing because when you're trying mm. to build these relationships, especially initially, you, you want to help all their clients. Um, and I did, you know, I burnt many, many hours seeing clients um, <laughs> early on that, you know, weren't going anywhere. And again, like you said, lovely people and happy to help anyone. But, you know, at the end of the day, we're trying to, trying to run a business. That's um, right. But building on that, you know, continuing to go back. And I think one of the biggest things, which is hard initially, but when they do refer a client that's not quite right, is actually really giving them that feedback as to why and why you can't help that person. Because, you know, if you don't, if you're all nice about it, which I am a nice guy generally, and uh, of course, you know, you that or not. Um, <laughs> but essentially, you've got to, you know, you've got to keep having those conversations because I, you know, in the early days I did, I just tried to help them all. And, you know, it's, it's not ideal for you. It's not ideal for the client because they're not getting necessarily the right outcome. They're getting some good information, but, the accountants aren't getting the feedback that they shouldn't be sending that person, so they'll just keep doing it. So it's really that mm. that ongoing. I mean, I don't think there's any secret to it, but you know, a lot of people say this. I think it does take a lot of time with centers of influence. And you know, my other business, Hunt Wealth, I've never really gone down that path because we just nurtured our clients and we just get natural referrals from online clients. And my sort of, I guess, success rate with those client referrals is you know astronomical compared to the, the success rate with the, the accounting world. That's getting better, but where it started, it was very different numbers. So it is, you know, focusing yeah. on time where it's most productive. Yeah, and I think that with clients, because they understand, especially when you get a client referral, because you've helped them, obviously they can yeah. articulate what you've done and then they're going to talk to people and 
the people are going to come wanting the sort of help that you've already done. Whereas with someone that's in a different sphere, it is obviously um, different. My last question on that on that JV type setup is like, if you could go back to the start of that, what would you do differently? What are some of the lessons that you picked up that you would change um, as a result of the learnings over the last little while? Probably really focusing on that education from the, the day, you know, from the get go. So initially, I mean, I came in, the business was a bit of a mess, to be honest. So I was tidying up and this was just as FDS and all those things came in. So I was trying to figure out, like they didn't even really know what the client base looked like because they just had the advisors manage that. So I had to step yeah. in and try and figure it all out. So it was challenging, but I think spending more time with the actual accountants from the get go um, and maybe to my earlier point, not being so nice about trying to help everyone <laughs> and telling the accountants they're doing a good job when they're referring someone they shouldn't be. So um, you do, I mean, you, you know, you've got to do it the right way, but the sooner you can have those sometimes tough conversations, the better off it'll be for everyone. Mm, I like it. Tell us, Sean, you've been at it for a while in, in your business and I think a, a reasonably common story in the industry where you pick up you know, a handful of clients from someone that's winding back from their uh, advice work and then you've gone out you know, building, building your business from there. Um, how have you tackled, like how has the service solution evolved over that time and how have you tackled the, you know, how you've changed things over time? Yeah, I think a, a big focus has been, you know, trying to help the right select group of clients. So as you said before, I mean, my business aim is to, to not really help more than, I mean, I want to help everyone, but more than a sort of, you know, 100 or so clients because um, my business has been built around from day one, um, as we probably talked about earlier, is keeping flexible. And so I've got a young family and that time is very precious to me. So I've never been one to sort of flog myself too hard. But the business has evolved a lot in terms of, when I took it over, again, they were trying to help everyone. So really being clear about who you can help and, and what you need to charge to be able to do that. So if you're only going to have 100 clients, you know, for full disclosure, I'm aiming for to get you know, business revenue of about half a million. So you know, we're all financial advisors. We can do the maths on that, on what each client needs to be paying. Um, so you've got to find that balance of, of getting the right people into the business. Um, and early on, you know, this would be the same for most people, is you, you do try and help everyone and, and take everything on. But... It's one of those lessons, and I think I've heard other people say it on this very podcast, is that you know if everyone could go back, they would start with the right clients from day one, even though it's hard mm. to do, um, but really you know, focusing on that. And that's what's been the biggest, I guess, evolution is being able to say no to some clients. And at the end of the day, you can still help them and educate them, but just say now is not the right time for you, or you know, there's someone else that's probably better off to help you in your position. Um, but being comfortable to do that, which early on, you know, when I was a youngster, um, it was hard to, to turn people away as well. <laughs> of course, yeah, because in early days, you want to obviously get the revenue in the door and uh, you see the opportunity that's there. But And we, we've um, worked, we've got a fairly targeted service solution, but I know that for us as well that earlier on in the piece that there were clients that you'd get an opportunity to work with and think, oh, like you could make them work, but you could make it work, but... I found that sometimes, well, oftentimes that when you do that, that it's like you have to work with people differently to how you want to work with your ideal client and you, you're working with different products and different solutions. It's like we don't deal with a lot of um, clients that have self-managed super funds and yeah, we yeah. have a handful of them. But when we, when we, when we work with a client like that, it's just like the, there's a whole bunch of different things that need to change in the process. And that means that it's difficult for the team, the operations people, it ends up consuming more time. And even if you charge more than what you would typically charge, your the resourcing that goes into it might be, you know, significantly higher. And therefore, while the dollars might be higher, you're you sort of end up not not being as as profitable or, you know, sometimes spending so much time that you're not profitable at all. So um, yeah, I think that now we really consistent with with who we what we deliver and how we help people and i think that for us that if we've got a client that buys into that great let's let's work together and we can you know walk off into the sunset but um if we don't then that's okay as well there's an army of great financial advisors out there that that will be right for them but um not not just the right fit for us but yeah totally get the challenge that when you're um 
when you're building a business that it's it's not always easy to, to it's, it's too tempting it's too tempting just to but it's like you say I mean, when you've got your business working with the right clients it's it's a beautiful humming machine everyone knows what they're doing why they're doing it and the clients are getting the best outcomes and as soon as you try and adapt that machine to the client it does it just it, something falls off and it, yeah, it's, yeah it's never the best outcome for anyone yeah. absolutely and so you you've kept the uh your your business small so that you could build that flexibility into what you do i feel like i might have ended up in your shoes that was my intention when i when i started my business if i was a little bit early with uh, with starting a family i i'd see a, a mountain of benefit in having that um flex and um ability to yeah sort of manage your schedule and um be efficient in what you do i'm interested to unpack like how, how have you tackled, you know, efficiencies in your business? You said you got target client numbers, but what, what does that journey look like for you? Yeah, it's, it's interesting. You said that the business is coming up to 10 years, which happens quite quickly. And, you know, in the last couple of years, I thought maybe I should actually start working on this business rather than just flowing along as I have been for a while. Um, so it has been really building out, you know, the processes and the services and, and being clear about, you know, who we're taking on and how we're helping them. For me, as I said before, it's working as, as lean as I can. I mean, obviously being a sole advisor with one support staff has its own challenges. So I said to you earlier that, you know, my support staff was out in isolation for a week or two and um, I don't know how to do her job anymore. I used to didn't know how to do it at one point. But, <laughs> yeah, it just didn't work and I didn't even know where the client documents were, were anymore. So it's really being, you know, as efficient as possible in terms of, the business structure and, and how we do our, our work and I outsource power planning, so that part's all, all quite efficient. But it's it's yeah, the clear processes, which is something I've really been knuckling down on the last year or two, is um, you know building out sort of a not a standard operating procedure, but an operations manual that you know we can access easily. And again, doing the training video, sorry, training videos using Loom for, for staff. And you know, mm. my intention in the next next six to twelve months will be bringing on an offshore. Um, staff member as well so part of preparing for that is actually making sure because my um, CSO she's awesome she knows what she has to do so when I've done my work I give her the file everything's sort of done it's not me yeah. you know, chasing her up or following her up but when obviously I bring in another staff member that's it's all going to change I can't just assume they know everything like she does mm. so that's that's been a bit of a focus on actually getting the business into better shape and not being so reliant on, on what's in my head or what's in Kerry's head at the moment yeah, totally. That's definitely one of the advantages that I found as we started growing our team that um, you do, there's a lot of key seat risk. And when you've got someone that's great, then that's all great. But if there's any yeah. personal issues or any sort of things happen, that it's, it can be a real um, spanner. So I've been, one of the things that gives me a bit of peace of mind with where we're at at the moment is that now we've got multiple people in in almost all of the key seats such that it's there is a little bit less disruption if someone wants to take leave or gets uh, COVID locked down or, or whatever. Um, but look, I've got good news for you because I, like you, when I started my business, I always intended for it to just be me as the advisor. I worked solo for a year, then I wrote my wife in, my now wife, she wasn't my wife at the time, but roped her in and we worked together two and a half years and it was just us. We did have a a couple of different offshore resources at different points in time, which didn't work particularly well, but um, did do some stuff, um, mainly because of our uh, management and, and the learnings that needed to happen to, to make yeah, that. Yeah. The good thing that I found is that in that time, because we, we put a lot of the processes in place to make things really easy and efficient from a day-to-day -day perspective, that when it did come time to actually adding more team into the business, that it was already quite clear and it made that process a lot easier. Whereas sometimes I think if you're just trying to do it all from the start, sometimes you're just figuring a lot of those things out. And I don't know, I suppose there are certainly people that do it, but um, mate, you've, you've got it. It's all, there, it's all there for you. So look out. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you never know. Next time we talk, it might not be so simple. Uh, we'll see. Yeah. <laughs> well, mates, uh, yeah, I, I think that that the efficiency is the core, and whether you whether you've got one advisor or ten advisors, I think it's all um, it's it's the same the same strokes, I suppose, in terms of wanting to ensure that wh whoever is in the team and whoever's working with your clients is doing that efficiently. 
Um, what's the tech? What what tech stack do you use in your business? Out of interest. Uh, yeah, so with our licensee, we um, we have Xplan, um, which is everyone's favorite and least favorite piece of software. Um, yeah, we use it. We use it pretty well. Um, I think Xplan is what you make of it. Um, it's you know it's somewhat crazy, totally, but it can do you know what you need it to do. Um, outside of that, I mean, all the things that probably all the XY guys now use, and some of them I got from paying attention to the XY group. So you know, Calendly's Calendly's a good one, um, just in terms of making client appointments easy and the reminders and all those things. Um, so we use Loom for training videos, and I use them for. You know, sending client videos if I'm explaining something or anything like that. Um, Zoom and Teams for online meetings. Um, we do use the Astute Wheel for new clients, so getting some of that initial data in, um, which okay. is, I've, I've used for a long time, and that's probably the main one. So we use Planner for managing sort of tasks and things. So I've never done tasks in Xplan. Uh, we did get the, by Xplan one. So with my original licensee, when we left, they just – deleted everything so we kind of were hesitant to ever build everything out into explain again so um, we we yeah, we have gone a little bit outside of that but it's that same thing of trying not to have you know 10 different softwares we're logging into um so now trying to trying to find solutions that might not be perfect but they sort of link into each other really mm. as well yeah for us i've found that we've recently come well, it's actually the first time I've used Xplan in the business, but we we tried a few different solutions, and um, yeah, I found that using having multiple systems where you're and we had tasks in all sorts, everything from Google Docs. We added in Asana for a while. We used a thing called Rike, which I think I leveraged from someone in the XY network for a while. Went to Practify, like then having it across multiple systems, it just it's challenging a little bit for one person or like, you know, for a small team, but then when you've got multiple people across all the things that it just became so um, complex and difficult to manage that having an integrated solution. And I don't think it's, it still blows me away that I don't think there's any perfect solution out there. I think a lot of them are like you say, it's sort of what you make of it. And I'm hopeful that that technology will evolve to the point that, we can, um, yeah, get get more of, of those things in one solution. But, um, yeah, I don't think there's any perfect one at the moment. Um, and But having it all integrated into one is is significantly more, um, significantly easier from an operations workflow perspective than doing it, trying to patch it together in a whole bunch of different ways. Um, yeah, it's hard because some of them do provide the, almost the perfect solution for their each individual thing but when you put them all together like you say it just becomes a mess you yeah to figure out what's in where yeah that's right and they still don't talk to each other which seems like a, <laughs> a little bit crazy it seems like it should be simple but i think that that's the um challenging part of tech is that you go well that that should be easy but that's often always the hardest um the hardest thing just talking on on that like efficiency and maybe tech maybe not tech but like with the learnings that you've had over the over the last you know almost 10 years if you were to go back to the start thinking about your workflows and how you're working with clients what would you do differently there yeah i think you know getting your service offering as clear as possible early is pretty important so again when i started i was trying to do everything for everyone and you know i work predominantly in their retirement space. And when I'm dealing with those clients, you know, we have everything we need to have, all the conversations we need to have, all the tools to help educate them. Um, and when I'm working with, you know, younger clients, as I said, we do a lot. And, you know, I did, the, the previous advisor I worked for was, as a lot of the older advisors are, was a big time risky back in the day. Um, so there was a big focus when I was sort of learning and being mentored by him around the importance of insurance. And I've had a lot of claims that, reinforce that um so they're you know they're the two key areas i sort of can help the start outs and help the retirees um but when i've tried to again like you said before build on other services so i've tried i don't know how you do it but i'm very impressed by how you do it the cash flow side of things i've tried almost every piece of software to get that right and i've never been able to quite get you know, the clients on board or or get the right model so you know, when I deal with younger clients, we do talk about cash flow and spending plans and all those things, but I don't, I don't set up the structures or, or track it for them. We just have those ongoing conversations, and I cross my fingers when they leave the office, they have somewhat of an idea of what they're doing. Yeah. Um, but we do like when I 
deal with those clients, we call it sort of the foundational plan. So getting the, the structures and the initial setup right. And you know, for some of those clients, we don't have necessarily an ongoing advice relationship. We just sort of set them up and say, you know, come back when something changes or when you need to. We still stay in touch with them, obviously. But you know, as I said again, when I started, each and every client, there was this mindset of, you know, they have to be an ongoing client. Whereas now it's like, well, if they're not quite there yet now, we can help them and obviously, you know, get get paid for the initial work that needs to be done. But they don't have to be an ongoing client. They can just be a you know, someone that we help when, when the time is right in the future as well. Mm. Well, mate, you don't need to overthink it with the uh, the tech around that cash flow piece, an Excel spreadsheet and a bank account or maybe five, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. maybe another feed if, if if you want to track it ongoing. And, um, yeah, I've that. just never been able to do it. I've looked at every, like I've looked at obviously, yeah, anything anyone's put out, um, but I've just never quite, quite mastered it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, mate, I'll leave that one for the professionals like you. Yeah. <laughs> Look, I think that that cash flow piece has been a journey that I, um, yeah, it, it's certainly challenging, and it's challenging with because everyone's different in terms of the way that they want to manage their their cash flow as well. So, I think that the lesson that I've found with trying to, we in the early days, we tried to flex on it and do it differently for different people. But I found that that just doesn't work, and now we just have the conversation up front with people to say, "Look, this is this is our solution. We do it in this way because we've found it to be really effective across everybody." It does mean that you're going to need to bend a little bit, um, but at the end of the day, you're coming to us because we're the experts here. And if you want us to help you, we have to be able to help you, plus the other people um, that walk through the door after you. And therefore, you know, you need to use a solution that works across those as well. Yeah, I, yeah. Um, that was a bit of a mindset shift for me in terms of the conversation with people, but I found it well received. And I think if it sometimes people, well, oftentimes people are just happy to lean into a system if they know that it's it's going to work. But you absolutely need to have the I's dotted and T's crossed, I think, before you jump in. Otherwise, it uh, as soon as because with cash flow in particular, people are almost looking for an excuse to bin the. They system. want to break it, yeah. yeah they want to. So um, if you if you give them that opportunity, they'll exploit it and then uh, blow in their budget. So I'd say that that's yeah. um, that's probably key. But uh, yeah, do you find it? You find something that works for the business, works for the clients, and. Um, it's uh, yeah, it's super super helpful. If we get something, it's something that's such a small thing, but it's something that consistently, like when I get our clients to come onto the podcast, they often talk about the spreadsheet and the bank accounts as one of the biggest things. Even though I might save them half a million bucks in tax for their business restructuring or something like that, but yeah. you know, they have three hundred dollar a week spending allowances. Like that. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one. That's the key. Yeah. yeah. Uh, mate, I could um, I could honestly probably talk about that all day, but I, I won't bend your ear off on, on cash flow. My last <laughs> question for you, and really appreciate you sharing your insights, but if you could go back to yourself day one of opening the, you know, rolling down the shingle for the business and opening the doors, what would be the one piece of advice you would give yourself? Yeah, wow. Well, um, I think, you know, when you care about what you do and, you know, you know what you're doing and it's being confident in our advice. And like you just said then is, you know, the clients are coming to us seeking our guidance. And sometimes you get hesitant that, you know, what you're doing is not quite right for them. But when you know what you're doing and, you know, as I said, you really care about the clients. Like I, I say this to my clients in the retiree space that I give them the same advice I'd give to my mum. And that's all my data should, should be listening to. But um, they're, often, they're often women up having these yeah, conversations. Mum has lived more than dad. Yeah, that's right. That's right. He wouldn't care. But it's it's just having that confidence that you know we are we're all trying to do the right thing for our clients. We're trying to help them. Obviously, the cost of doing so have changed a lot in the last few years. But at the end of the day, you know, there's only so many people you can help. And you just got to be confident in what you're doing and and know you're doing the right thing for them. You know, and if they don't want to do it, that's fine because there is someone else that you know is willing to take the advice. But it's really you know if you know what you're doing and you know you've got the right solution, then just just backing yourself to keep pushing with it. Mate, I love it. I love it. Um, some good insights there, mate. Thank you so much for sharing your story. Really appreciate it. Beautiful. Keep good to see you again, mate. <laughs> All good. Keep on that cash flow train. Yeah, train. But, uh, it's gone. It's gone. It's gone. <laughs> cool, mate. All right. Cheers, guys. Right. We'll catch you next time.